who emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Jesus left the glory of heaven above. Jesus renounced his power and command. Jesus came to earth as a poor, hungry child. Jesus gave his life that we may live, and now he is exalted on high. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord.
The book is called The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come, and he would gather. and make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat her apples. And they would play hide and go seek together. And when he was tired, he would sleep in her shed. And the boy loved the tree very much. And the tree was happy. But time went by. And the boy grew older. And the tree was often all alone. Then one day, the boy came to the tree. And the tree said, come boy, and come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. I am too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and then you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time after that. And the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back. And the tree shook with joy. And she said, come, boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife, and I want children to see me once gone. And I, and I so need a house. Well, can you give me a house? I have no house. The forest is my house. But you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy, said the tree. <coughs> and so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, finally, the tree was so happy that she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered. Come and play. I'm too old and too sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat with it, said the tree. Then you can sail away and then you'll be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made his boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. After a long time, the boy came back. I'm sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to do. My teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot even swing on them. I'm too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You cannot climb. I'm too tired to climb, said the boy. I am sorry, sighed the tree. I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. Just an old stump. I am sorry. You see the stump? Well, I don't think very much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and 
Join me now for the prayer for illumination.
to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. May God richly bless the reading and the hearing of this portion of the word for our understanding. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of this year's journey through the narrative lectionary. We began in September with the Old Testament and went straight through the Old Testament, taking some highlights and following the story of God with the people of Israel. At Christmas time, we picked up with the story of Jesus using the Gospel of John and followed through that Gospel to, to follow the story of Jesus. Since Easter, we have been looking at the New Testament church and seeing how the Gospel began to spread We've looked at New Testament texts which show us how the good news about Jesus started spreading through the whole world. We remember that the story began with a small band of fearful followers who received the good news that the cross and the tomb did not have the last word, that their friend Jesus had risen and was alive. At Pentecost, they received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk more about next week on Pentecost. And the Spirit gave them courage and understanding to begin spreading the good news through their words and deeds. As is so often the case, the momentum of spreading the good news increased dramatically as a result of some tragic events. Saul was one of the Pharisees, one of the leaders of Judaism, who determined that the disciples now were a threat to Judaism, and they needed to be snuffed out. The church needed to be snuffed out, just as Jesus had been. So they stoned Stephen to get to death for a sermon that he preached that was very antagonistic toward Judaism. They began persecuting Christians harshly. This persecution caused disciples and other followers of Jesus to scatter away from Jerusalem in search of safe places. As a result of this scattering, one of the deacons named Philip ended up in Samaria and went from place to place in Samaria telling the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may remember that the Samaritans were ancient enemies of the Jewish people. They wouldn't associate together. But you also remember the story we looked at in John's Gospel a couple of months ago when Jesus was in a Samaritan village and he encountered a woman at the well. They had a conversation and many in the village came to faith in Jesus because of her testimony. And now Philip is back in this Samaritan region and has tremendous success in convincing people of the truth of the good news. It is such a success, in fact, that Peter and John come to help, and lots of good is accomplished. Then Philip went south towards Gaza, a place very much in the news this week, and encountered a eunuch from Ethiopia who had been in Jerusalem and was on his way home. He was a member of the queen's court. The Ethiopian was riding in a chariot and reading the scriptures, but he didn't understand it, and Philip stopped and talked with him, and the man asked him if he could explain what he was reading. Philip did, and then he went on to tell him the good news about Jesus. The Ethiopian asked to be baptized, and Philip baptized him. And the good news went south, all the way into Africa, into Ethiopia, along with him. Peter had a vision one night in which he was told to go to the home of a Gentile named Cornelius in Caesarea. The vision told him that those things he had always regarded as unclean, including Gentiles, were no longer to be regarded as unclean. So he went to the home of Cornelius, and he was astonished at his response to the gospel and the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and all of his household. 
And Peter baptized them. So instead of stamping out the gospel, Saul and his colleagues had started a movement which unwittingly caused it to spread like wildfire. And God was not through with Saul yet. For on his way to persecute the church in Damascus, Saul was struck blind and encountered by Jesus in a vision. Saul was converted to Christianity that day and he was called to service. But due to his persecution of Christians in the past, the disciples had a very difficult time accepting Saul's conversion as valid and welcoming him as a fellow leader in the Christian movement. As a result, Paul, Saul went his own way and became the missionary to the Gentile world, taking the Greek name of Paul in place of his Hebrew name of Saul. So another bad thing, the unwillingness of disciples to accept Saul as a Christian and as a leader, led to the amazing spread of the good news throughout the known world. Paul made three missionary journeys through Asia Minor to some of the islands of the Mediterranean, eventually on to Europe. A few weeks ago, we looked at a story from his visit to Philippi and then another from his trip to Athens in Greece. He always wanted to go to Rome, the center of the great power, the Roman Empire. He wrote them a letter before he ever went, but the only way he ever got there was as a prisoner. Last time he was in Jerusalem, he was arrested and put on trial. And as a Roman citizen, he appealed to Rome and was taken there for his trial. When the Philippian church heard that Paul was in prison in Rome, they sent one of their people, one of their men, Epaphroditus, to, to Paul. They sent him a gift, and they told Epaphroditus to stay and help him in any way he could. Paul was always eager for news about how things were going in the churches he started, so I'm sure this was the big topic of conversation when Epaphroditus arrived. In response to the news that Epaphroditus brought and their generosity and thoughtfulness to him, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi for Epaphroditus to take back with him. The children introduced you to this letter last week in their wonderful service. This week and next week, we're looking at two more sections of this letter. Three words describe the letter of Philippians for me. Gratitude, humility, and joy. The section from last week overflowed with gratitude as Paul thanked his friends for not forgetting him. He wrote, I thank my God every time I think about you because you have shared in the gospel with me from the very first day even until now. And this also gives him joy but the boost they have given him, sending someone to him in prison, also gives him renewed hope, including hope that his imprisonment is going to serve a greater cause in the spread of the gospel. He writes, I'm going to continue to rejoice because I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. Gratitude and joy, maybe not the top two emotions you would expect to have in prison. The third word is humility. And the focus on this is because of the news Epaphroditus has brought about the church in Philippi, which troubles Paul greatly. He talks about humility for a couple of chapters, maybe to soften the people up before he starts naming names. But in chapter 4, he gets to the heart of the matter and writes, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask all of the rest of you to help these women for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. 
So here's the heart of the issue for Paul. Two women who have both been extremely important in his life and the life of the Philippian church have become enmeshed in a power struggle or a personality conflict or something. And whenever something like that happens, it doesn't affect just the two people. It affects everyone. It affects the whole church in this case. And it can bring paralysis or even a split. And it's not the case of one being a good person and the other being a bad person. It's not the case of one being right and one being wrong. I assure you that Paul would have said so if it was the case. It is a case of broken fellowship. And Paul calls on the two women to put it aside and accept each other. And he calls on the whole church to help them in this effort. In this particular case, it's two women who are involved, but in many situations, it's men, of course. And this is a universal problem in churches, in families, in workplaces, in schools, in government. It may start out with something small, but it becomes a matter of pride and principle and standing up for oneself. Hurt feelings turn into resentment, which turns into anger, which turns into warfare. And in the heat of battle, we forget all of the cost, both to ourselves and to others. Frederick Beekner writes, Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Well, watching this play out brings grief and sadness. And it has troubled Paul greatly to hear about it. And he's thought carefully about how he might be able to address it in a helpful way. And he's absolutely done some of his most powerful thinking and writing in this section. He introduces it in this way, with this exhortation. Live your life in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, standing side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. See, Paul knows that they want him to be proud of them. And he reminds them that if, even if he's not there, he hears about what is going on. It's like when your mother reminds you before you go out on a date, remember who you are. It's not just how you behave when the parents are around. It's how you behave when they're not. It's not just how you behave when the teacher's in the classroom. It's how you behave when she's not. It's not just how you behave while you're at church. It's how we behave when we leave. And we Christians should remember that God is always around, always watching. But Paul has an even more persuasive argument than their wanting to please him. He's going to hold up the example of Jesus, the center of their faith, and he's going to tell us that our highest calling is to imitate Jesus. So in today's chapter, he starts out with this appeal to do the right things in order to make him happy. Make me happy by doing these things. He starts out with a general appeal to unity. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. In humility, regard other people as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. 
humility, unselfishness, teamwork, unity. But then he takes it up that other notch by calling his friends to imitate Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. He took the form of a slave. He was born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Throughout the spring, John's gospel reminded us that Jesus existed from the beginning with God. The world was created in and through him. He is the light and the life of the world. Paul says that in order to redeem us, Jesus gave all of that up. Gave all of it up. He emptied himself. He poured himself out literally and figuratively. He went from being God with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining to being a normal person with feelings, with blood, sweat, and tears. He was even willing to allow others to have power over him, to try him and condemn him and put him to death on a cross, even a criminal's death. So when we think about Jesus doing this, it should shame us for seeking power, for holding grudges, for holding on to the little things that divide us. But Paul isn't content just to shame us. He wants to urge us to do the right thing for the right reason. He wants us to live the same way Jesus did, to empty ourselves of rights and privileges and to open ourselves to hurt in order to serve others and serve the world. Due to circumstances in the Philippian church, it was two women whose conflict brought about Paul's beautiful writing. But today on Mother's Day, it is important to note that mothers are frequently the very best example we have of living out this unselfish, emptying life of love and service that Paul describes Jesus living. Most mothers, in truth, die a thousand deaths in raising their children. I know not all mothers live up to this, but a very large number do. I know the three primary ones in my life have been shining examples of it, always looking first not to their own interests and needs, but to the interests and needs of others. And I'm grateful and thankful to them for modeling this Christ-like love and humility with their children. I hope there are some mothers in your lives and some other people, male and female, who have demonstrated the power and the goodness of this way of life in a way that has made a difference for you. Paul's not done yet. He's sitting in prison, <coughs> prisoner of the Roman Empire. The Philippians, many miles away, are living very much under the same oppressive power of the same Roman emperor, the one who is praised as a god and regarded as the Lord of all. In such a system, it's easy to be resentful, to feel like a victim, to feel powerless. But Paul reminds them how things ended for Jesus. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, even that name of Caesar, so that at the name not of Caesar but of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the result of emptying, the result of being humbled, result of giving his life away as the giving tree did. Things are not always as they seem. The one who seems to have all the power may have nothing. The one who seems to have given away everything may have gained everything. Choose the way of Christ. Therefore, my beloved, Paul concludes, 
just as you have always obeyed me, <clears throat> not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Certitude and arrogance are the opposite of humility. And Paul knows what an enemy they are to Christianity. He himself earlier in his life was so certain of himself as a Pharisee that he was willing to persecute and even kill Christians because he was certain this was what God wanted him to do. He learned that he was absolutely going the wrong direction from what God wanted when he was stopped dead in his tracks on the Damascus Road. So now he warns everyone who is sure they're right, sure others are wrong, sure they know only the only way to salvation, to take a step back and in humility realize that there's much that we do not know and that God alone holds the key to salvation. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, which I interpret to mean approach it with humility Turn your life and future over to God rather than arrogantly declaring what God is going to do either for me or for someone else. And lastly, Paul says, do everything without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. That's a really optimistic way to begin living a Christian life of value. You don't have to start by solving world hunger. You don't have to start by going to North Korea as a missionary. If you can go through this day without murmuring and without arguing, then you shine like a star in the world and you make a difference blooming where you're planted. Having the mind of Christ is what can lead us into this kind of life and making this kind of difference. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we respond to the good news in our lives, I invite you to begin by standing and joining me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. If you're not familiar with it, it's found in the very front of your hymn book at the top of page 35. Let us confess the basics of our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for the beauty of this day. We're grateful for your calling us together as your people in this place to worship you. We ask that you'll send us forth to serve you with our lives. We give you thanks today for reminding us of the life of your son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to empty himself and live as a human in our midst so that he could teach us what you are like and how much you love us how much you're willing to give for us. Pray that you will not only fill us with gratitude and joy because of his example, but that you will fill us with humility and the desire to follow his example. On this day, we give you thanks for mothers, for the mothers of our congregation. Pray your strength for them as they engage in their difficult jobs. We ask that you will help them to receive joy and fulfillment in serving you in this way. We ask that you be with all for whom this day is a difficult one, whether from grief at having lost mother recently or uh, from not having such warm memories of their mothers. We ask your healing and strength for them as well on this day and your peace. We pray for all who are sick today, for all who are hospitalized, for those who care for them. Pray for those who are grieving. Pray for people in the world where life is difficult now, particularly in the Middle East. We ask your guidance for leaders there and elsewhere to lead towards peace. Pray for hope for all, for things to look forward to, for joy to be found in daily tasks and daily living for encouragement to give and receive, for hope in each situation of life. We ask that you'll fill us with your joy and peace and that you'll hear us now as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to receive the offering this morning, let me remind you that the uh, envelopes are in the pews and pew racks for the Mother's Day offering. If you wish to participate in that, if you're not ready to today but would like to, you're welcome to take the envelope and bring it back next week. Those gifts go to support the Presbyterian communities of our state, and it specifically helps those who have outlived their resources to continue to stay there. So now let's present God's tithes and our offerings and Mother Day gift to the Lord.
Lord, we are grateful to you for all of your gifts to us in our lives. We ask that you'll receive these gifts from our hands and use them for the purposes of your kingdom, that you'll use the gifts given for the Mother's Day offering and use them to support those who need help in our Presbyterian communities. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.